One hundred and four. Idolatry. Over the years, I have repeatedly encountered the following complaints or variations of it among couples having marital conflicts. The husband will say, I come home after a hard day's work, and it never occurs to her to greet me with a kiss or to show any pleasure in seeing me. The wife will say, He comes home day after day and never thinks of giving me a kiss. All he brings home is his tiredness and grumpiness. The obvious answer is to say that each should take the first step in being loving or in greeting the other happily and with a kiss. Such an answer does not register, however. The quick answer is that the situation is too complicated for such a simple solution, and this is, of course, true. What is involved is idolatry, and man's basic and most passionately worshipped idol is himself. The essence of original sin is this idolatry. The tempter's plan was that every man should be his own god, determining what constitutes good and evil for himself. Genesis chapter 3 verse 5 Idolatry has many facets, and the basic aspect is our worship of ourselves and our own will. In the New Testament, hypocrisy is closely related to idolatry. The Septuagint twice uses the Greek Hippocrates to translate godless. Christ called attention to hypocrisy in the Pharisees as a blindness to their faults, Matthew chapter 7 verse 5, to God's working, Luke chapter 12 verse 56, to a true sense of values, Luke chapter 13 verse 15, an overvaluation of human tradition, Matthew chapter 15 verse 7, Mark chapter 7 verse 6, sheer ignorance of God's demands, Matthew chapter 23 verses 14, 15, 25 and 29, and love of display, Matthew chapter 6 verses 2, 5 and 16. Because we are all born in Adam, hypocrisy is a fault common to all of us. We cannot begin to understand what our Lord has to say if we direct his words to hypocrites, to the Pharisees only, and exclude ourselves from their thrust. In particular, we cannot understand what our Lord has to say on judgment apart from understanding this fact. Our Lord does not forbid judgment. In fact, he requires it. Judge righteous judgment. John chapter 7 verse 24. In Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 to 5, hypocritical judgment is plainly and sharply condemned. Judge not, that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Several things are immediately apparent in this text. First, our Lord makes clear that he is addressing hypocrites and is describing hypocrisy. It is very convenient for people to say that this passage is about judging as wrong, when in fact it is about hypocrisy and the hypocrite's judgment. Second, our Lord never says the hypocrite is a liar. The mote is there in the brother's eye. There is a need for us to see clearly to cast the mote out of our brother's eye. The subject of our Lord's condemnation here is clearly not a case of false witness. It is hypocritical judgment. Third, the hypocrite talks. He shoots off his mouth. He sees faults often clearly, sharply and intelligently. The hypocrite does not falsify the evidence. 
We have today many scholars who defend the Pharisees and feel that their reputation for hypocrisy is undeserved. Clearly the Pharisees were in very many ways superior men. Their observations on their times were incisive and highly moral. The problem, however, with all hypocrisy is that it is critical talk, not godly action. Our Lord makes clear that the moat in the brother's eye needs removing. The hypocrite sees the moats everywhere, and his answer is to condemn and withdraw. For both in Matthew and Luke, our Lord stresses love as the counterpart to hypocritical judgments. Thus, in Luke chapter 6, verses 31 to 36, we are told, immediately preceding the comments on judgment, of the love which grace manifests. And then in verses 37 to 45, the meaning of a non-hypocritical life is set forth. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. And he spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his master, but every one that is perfect shall be as his master. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but perceivest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Either how canst thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil, for of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. This passage is a favourite one with antinomians who isolate it from the rest of Scripture in order to give it their particular meaning. Also, it involves a mistranslation in verse 35, which reproduces the Vulgate rather than the Greek. Lend, hoping for nothing again, should be rendered, as Goodsby did. Lend to them, never despairing. To understand what our Lord here says, it is necessary to realise, first, reciprocity ethics is clearly not enough. The perversion of the golden rule is condemned. Some would read it as, Do unto others as they have done unto you. That is, on a quid pro quo basis. In some cultures, wedding presents are assessed and valued at the door, so that, later, an exactly equivalent gift can be returned. In verses 32 to 34, reciprocity ethics is denied by the citation of three examples. Our Lord drives home his condemnation of reciprocity ethics by declaring, in verse 35, 
love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for or expecting nothing again or in return. Our Lord is not requiring a policy of foolishness on our part, nor setting down the guidelines for the spiritual Franciscans. He is sharply condemning reciprocity ethics. Just as a rich young man was told to sell all he had, not because this was a requirement for believers, but to bring him face to face with his basic faith and loyalty, in himself and his riches. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 22. So our Lord confronts all who hold to reciprocity ethics with the requirement that they forsake themselves for Christ the Lord. Second, the hypocrite holds to reciprocity ethics because he sees himself as central, not the Lord. Our reward is not from men, but from the Father, and when done unto him, our reward shall be great. Verse 35. If we expect a reward from men, we will judge them for their failures, and we will see ourselves as central. They have failed us taken advantage of us, or been thoughtless toward us. If we are servants of the Lord, we expect our thanks and reward from Him, because we have done it for His sake, not man's. Third, the hypocrite tells the truth, that is, he describes men accurately, but he judges as though he were God. God is on the judgment throne, not man. We are not to usurp God's judgments, The meaning of verse 37 is, Judge not, so that God may not judge you. One who never misses a chance to cite the failures and sins of others and to judge them will have God citing their every sin and judging them. Theirs is not righteous judgment, however correct, but censorious judgment, hypocritical judgment. It does not seek the removal of our brother's moat that is, the fault of a fellow believer, but to condemn him for it. It manifests neither love, patience, nor forbearance, but distaste and distance. Fourth, we are not only told that our Father will reward us, but when we fulfill the Lord's requirement of obedient and brotherly love, men shall give unto us. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over, Shall men give into your bosom? Verse 38. Instead of a reciprocity ethics, we have an ethics of godly generosity. Reciprocity ethics puts a sour distance between men and between man and God. The ethics of godly generosity brings God and man together, and it brings men closer to one another, not because it saves or changes the sinner, but because it accomplishes God's purpose and thus fits into God's purposes for our lives and theirs. Hypocrisy is thus an aspect of idolatry, because a hypocrite warps reality by judging men in relation to himself, not himself and men together in relation to the Lord. Hypocritical judgment is personal, not theological It is personal even when it cites moral faults only, that is, motes in the other person's eye, because its principle in judgment is our irritation and annoyance with them, not our struggle to heal ourselves and them also of our mutual infirmities. St. Paul states it plainly. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of a vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Having said these things, it is necessary to add, lest Scripture be misinterpreted, that we cannot use these passages to justify overlooking heresies, being indulgent of their errors, or of any attempt to forestall a judgment of their errors. We are strictly forbidden such conduct. 2 John verses 9 to 11. It is never our kindly disposition which is the criterion. 
It is the Lord and his word. To elevate our kindness or love in any form to a position of priority is idolatry. Judging and condemning come very easily to some. Being indulgent and tolerant comes very readily to others. Neither course is godly. Both are ruled by man's disposition rather than the word of God. This constitutes idolatry. The first two commandments forbid idolatry. To assume that idolatry is to be restricted to the literal use of idols is to misunderstand the Bible. We should remember that St. Paul identifies covetousness, among other things, as idolatry. Galatians chapter 3, verse 5.